Eta had four gunshots in close succession. Her estimation was that it was about three o'clock. Soon thereafter, she heard someone crying out loud. It seemed to her that it was a woman's voice, but her husband told her that it was the accused crying. Although it was not established how her husband knew that it was the accused who was crying, this piece of evidence is enough to throw some doubt on the evidence of the witnesses who were adamant that they had heard a woman scream. Dr. and Mrs. Stipp gave evidence that the screaming was heard between the first and the second sounds. Mr. and Mrs. Ntlenget was the evidence was that the crying out loud occurred shortly after the first sounds. This version has a ring of truth. I say this because Mr. Ntlengetwa called security at 316.36 to report the crying out loud. Lending credence to this is the evidence of Mr. Johnson and Ms. Berger, which was that the screaming occurred between approximately 3.12 and 3.17. Mrs. Steep's time seemed to be wrong as it does not accord with the times of other witnesses. She relied on her radio clock to estimate the time of the events as they unfolded. According to her, when she woke up, the clock showed 3.02. She stated that her clock would have been three minutes early. She was about to get up when she heard three sounds which sounded like gunshots. She communicated this to her husband, who, having left the bedroom earlier to go to the big balcony, returned to the bedroom to make a phone call. At 3.15.51, Dr. Stipp made a call to security, and then at 3.17, he attempted to call 10 triple one. The timing of the call to security is important as it is an indication that the time when Mrs. Stipp heard the gunshots must have been much later than 300 hours too. I say this because from their evidence, it is clear that both Mr. and both Dr. and Mrs. Mrs. Stipp regarded the incident as an emergency which warranted prompt action. And there seems to be no reason why they would delay seeking help. Hence, as counsel for the defense correctly argued, it is unlikely that Mrs. Stipp would take as long as 13 minutes before she and her husband could respond to the emergency. It is more probable that the time Mrs. Stipp had shots was much later than the time that she mentioned. What is interesting is that Mr. Johnson, too, made his first call at 316. This call was made to Strubenskop Security. <coughs> this time is closer to the time mentioned by the Stips as the time Dr. Stipps made a call to security. Johnson made, made the call soon after he and his wife, Ms. Berger, had heard what they described as a woman screaming. They also heard a man shout help three times. It was only after this that they heard what they described as gunshots. It is clear from the rest of the evidence that these were actually sounds of a cricket bat striking against the toilet door. Mrs. Motswane, a neighbor of the accused, woke up to hear men crying very loudly. In a statement, she stated that when she heard a man cry out loud, it was about 3.20. This estimation, too, in my view, cannot be relied on as it was more like guessing, as she did not look at her time when she got up. 
What is also interesting about the evidence of Ms. Mrs. Motswane is that although she was an immediate neighbor of the accused, she did not hear the shots, but woke up when she heard a man crying. At the time the second sounds were heard, Ms. Dr. Stipp was on the phone trying to call 10 He described what he heard as three loud bangs, while Mrs. Stipp described the same sounds as three th third sounds. The number of these loud bangs or third sounds, as well as the time, is consistent with the version of the accused that soon after he had realized that the person behind the toilet door might have been the deceased, he ran to the balcony from where he screamed for help, took the cricket bat, and proceeded to the bathroom where he struck the, struck the toilet door three times with the cricket bat. Having dealt with the gunshots and the cricket bat sounds, the next question is, can the version of the accused that he is the one who was screaming on the morning of 14 February 2013 reasonably possibly be true? It is important to, re to recap the state's theory, which was that the accused and the deceased had an argument in the early hours of that morning an argument that was heard by Mrs. van der Merwe, that the deceased fled to the toilet, that the accused followed her there, and in the heat of further argument, the accused shot and killed her. In support of this theory, State Council pointed to, among other things, that the accused had... I'll have to rephrase that. In support of this state, this theory, State Council pointed to the fact that amongst other things, the deceased had a cell phone with her and had, had locked herself <coughs> inside the toilet. In my view, there could be a number of reasons why the deceased felt mm -hmm. the need to take her cell phone with her to the toilet. One of the possible reasons may be that the deceased needed to use her cell phone for lighting purposes as the light in the toilet was not working. To try to pick just one reason would be to delve into the realm of speculation. The state also led the evidence of WhatsApp messages that went to and fro the accused and the deceased a few weeks before the deceased was killed. The purpose of such evidence was to demonstrate to this court that the relationship between the accused and the deceased was on the rocks and that the accused had a good reason to want to kill the deceased. In a bid to persuade this court otherwise, the defendant or the defense placed on record more WhatsApp messages that painted a picture of a loving couple. In my view, none of this evidence from the state or from the defense proves anything. Normal relationships are dynam dynamic and unpredictable most of the times while human beings are fickle. Neither the evidence of a loving relationship nor of a relationship turned sour can assist this court to determine whether the accused had the requisite intention to kill the deceased. For that reason, this court refrains from making inferences one way or the other in this regard. There is also the matter of partially digested food that Professor Simon found in the stomach of the deceased body during the post-mortem examination <coughs> of the deceased. Counsel for the State submitted that this fact was a strong indication that a dinner 
was not at 1900 hours the night before as alleged by the accused, but closer to the time when the deceased was shot dead. He argued that that would explain the, I quote, argument, close quote, that was heard by Mrs. van der Merve just after she had woken up at 1.56. This argument seems to lose sight of the following. <coughs> One, that the experts agreed that gastric emptying was not an exact science it would therefore be unwise for this court to even attempt to figure out what the presence of partially digested food might mean as the evidence before this court is inconclusive. However, even if this court were to accept that the deceased had something to eat shortly before she was killed, it would not assist the state as the inference sought to be drawn by the state from this fact is not the only reasonable inference. She might have left the bedroom while the accused was asleep to get something to eat. <coughs> what complicates this, this matter is that it is not even clear when and if the alarm was activa activated at any given time that evening or that morning. Two, that Mrs. van der Merwe had no idea where the voice came from, what language that was being spoken, or what was being said. Accordingly, there is nothing in the evidence of Mrs. van der Merwe that links what, sound, what sounded like an argument to her to the incident at the house of the accused. What is of significance, however, is that Mr. Peter Barber the security guard was near the house of the accused at 2.20 on patrol. There is no evidence that Mr. Baba heard or saw anything untoward at the accused house at the time. I now deal with the defense case. The accused evidence is important as the accused is the only one who can tell this court how the incident happened. This evidence shall therefore be set out in detail. The accused evidence was that on the evening of 13 February 2014, at about 1900 hours, he and the deceased had dinner at his house. Soon thereafter, he had gone to bed early as he was tired. He estimated that the time was about 2,100 hours. In the early hours of the morning, he woke up to find the lights switched off. However, the sliding door was open and the two fans in the doorway were on. He spoke briefly to the deceased then got out of bed to bring the fence inside, close the sliding door, and draw the curtains. It was pitch dark, except for a slender blue LED light that came from the amplifier. <coughs> he picked up a pair of jeans belonging to the deceased and was about to place it on the blue light to block it out when he heard what sounded like the bathroom window sliding open and striking the frame. He thought it was an intruder gaining entry into his home, coming to attack him and the deceased. He was on his stumps and he felt vulnerable. After arming himself with his firearm, which he had removed from the left side of the bed, where he had left it the night before. He told the deceased to call the police, then proceeded to the passage which led to the bathroom. He shouted more than once to the intruders to get out. Meanwhile, he heard a door slam. 
the bathroom lights were off, but he could see from the entrance that the bathroom window was open while the toilet, toilet door was closed. There was no one in the bathroom. He did not know whether the intruder or intruders were on a step ladder outside the bathroom, <coughs> bathroom window or were inside the toilet. He had his firearm pointed in front of him. He then had a movement inside the toilet and thought that whoever was in the toilet was coming out to attack him. He gave evidence as follows, I quote, before I knew it, I had fired four shots at the door, dot, 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 close quote. He went back to the bedroom only to find that the deceased was not in the bedroom. It then occurred to him that the person he had shot at in the toilet might have been the deceased. He returned to the bathroom and found the toilet door locked. He returned to the bedroom, opened the sliding door, and screamed for help. He then put on his prosthesis returned to the bathroom and tried to open the door by kicking it. The door did not budge. He went back to the bedroom where he removed a cricket bat. At the time, he was screaming, shouting, and crying out. Back in the bathroom, he struck the door with a cricket bat three times. When the door panel broke, he removed the key which was on the floor and opened the door. The deceased was lying in a sitting position on the floor with her head on the toilet bowl. I rephrase this. The deceased was lying in a sitting position on the, on the floor with the head on the toilet bowl. After a brief struggle, to lift up the deceased, the accused finally managed to carry the deceased downstairs. He was descending the stairs when Mr. Stander and his daughter, Mrs. Filiun, walked in. Stander was res responding to the accused call for help that the accused had made earlier when he had spoken to him on the phone. I now deal with the accused defense. A perusal of the evidence. Of the accused shows a number of defenses or apparent defenses. On the version of the accused, it was not quite clear whether he had intended to shoot or not. This was exacerbated by the fact that Dr. Merrill Foster called on behalf of the accused, placed on doubt the accused's culpability at the time of the incident. Dr. Foster's evidence was that the accused suffered from a general anxiety disorder which may have affected his conduct at the time of the incident. Before dealing with the implications of Dr. Foster's evidence, however, it is convenient to scrutinize the evidence of the accused first, which might shed light on this defense. I've selected a few extracts from the accused evidence. The shooting was an accident. The accused said he shot in the belief that the intruders were coming out to attack him. He did not have time to think. He never intended to shoot anyone. He pulled the trigger when he heard the noise. He fired into the toilet door. He did not purposefully fire into the door. 
He fired shots at the door, but he did not do so deliberately. He never aimed at the door. The firearm was pointed at the door when he discharged, he discharged his firearm as he got a fright. He remembered pulling the trigger in quick succession. However, he could not remember firing specifically four shots. He, and I quote, fired before I could think, before I even had a moment to comprehend what was happening, close quote. I pulled the trigger at that moment when I heard the noise. I did not have time to think about what was happening. He stated once more, quote, before thinking, out of fear, I fired the shots, close quote. The discharge of the firearm was accidental, as he claimed that he did not intend to discharge his firearm in that he, I quote, was not meaning to shoot at anyone, close quote. He, quote, shot because I was at that point with that split moment, I believe somebody was coming out to attack me. That is what made me fire. I leave out something out of fear. I did not have time to think. I discharged my firearm, close quote. When the accused was asked to explain what he had meant by accident, when he gave his evidence, he answered as follows. I quote, the accident was that I discharged my firearm in the belief that an intruder was coming out to attack me. I leave out something. So the discharge was not accidental or was the discharge accidental? His answer, the discharge was accidental, my lady. I believed that somebody was coming out. I believed the noise that I heard inside the toilet was somebody coming out to attack me or to take my life, close quote. The accused stated that at no stage was he ready to discharge his firearm, though the firearm itself was in a ready mode. He confirmed that he had released the safety mechanism on the firearm in case he needed to use the firearm to protect himself. Responding to a question as to whether he had consciously pulled the trigger, he answered as follows. I quote, I did not think about pulling the trigger. As soon as I heard the noise, before I could think, I, I leave out something, pulled the trigger, close quote. The accused stated that he never thought of the possibility that he could kill people in the toilet. He considered, however, that thinking back retrospectively, it would be a probability that someone could be killed in the toilet. He stated that if he wanted to shoot the intruder, he would have shot higher up and more in the direction where the opening of the door would be to the far right of the door and at chest height. I pause to state that this assertion is inconsistent with that of someone who shot without thinking. I shall revert to this later in my judgment. Counsel for the defense argued that while the accused had in fact approached the bathroom in a state of readiness to defend himself and the deceased against a perceived threat, he did not consciously discharge his firearm in the direction of the toilet door. He argued that from the evidence of the accused, it is clear that the conduct of the accused and the death of the deceased were an accident.
We shall take an adjournment. We'll be back at half past 11. Quiet, ladies and gentlemen.